at the end of their careers, no matter where they end up, I want them to look back and think, People Fund grew me the fastest. They invested in me the most. They gave me opportunities that I wouldn't have gotten elsewhere at my level. They gave me the appropriate training and I was able to succeed and I grew the fastest there. That's what I want every employee of mine to be able to say. Hi, I am Sophie Vu, and this is the Rise and Play podcast. In the show, I sit down with influential thought leaders of the gaming industry to deconstruct how they create the best team and company cultures in order to create the best games. Every episode brings actionable insight to improve your leadership, self-awareness, and emotional management skills. Because becoming a better leader starts with becoming a better human. So, are you ready to unlock your full potential in life and business? Let's begin. I'm very excited to tell you more about today's sponsor, Sourcetan. I've been a big fan of Sourcetan Mission since I met the founders in the early days. As a product manager, I believe in deeper player research at a human and psychological level, understanding the why of the players instead of relying solely on behavioral data. The player intelligence products offer the insights you need to create novel experiences in your segment. Whether you're developing a new title or improving a live experience for millions of players, Source and AI-driven psychological insights provide a depth of player understanding that is impossible to achieve with surface-level metrics. Create more accurate product assumptions, accelerate development cycles, and improve marketing performance when you understand your players at a fundamental human level. Visit go.sourcen.io slash rise and play, that's S-O-L-S-T-E-N, for a demo and receive 30% off your first source and engagement crafted to your studio's needs. Learn why EA, Supercell, Wooga, and more use Sourcetan to create the best human-centric gaming experiences possible. So today I'm sitting down with Carole Mew and I'm super excited to talk to her. Before we start the conversation, let me give a few facts, an introduction about her. So she's a product leader and data scientist specializing in free-to-play mobile games. She has managed large distributed teams internationally and particularly enjoys growth leadership. Prior to joining the gaming industry, Carol was a university marketing lecturer and an economic expert in antitrust, intellectual property, and consumer law. Fun fact, she is also a lifelong gamer, and Carol was a finalist at the 2010 Nintendo Wii National Championship. Wow, congratulations. (laughs) Besides that, of course, she's currently the CEO at PeopleFun and growing the company from 100 million annual revenues in 2018 to over 300 million currently. For people who don't know about PeopleFun, the company is mostly known for big titles such as Wordscapes, Blockscapes, and Bricks and Balls for the ones who have followed those titles. Uh, So many things to follow up on. Hey, Carol, good morning. Thanks for joining. Good morning, Sophie. Thanks for inviting me to this chat. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, so many things to talk about. But here for the context today, let's start from how you join PeopleFun, which uh, we will talk a lot about today. What was the context? Where were you in your career when that happened? For which one when you joined? When was that? So I joined PeopleFun back in fall 2018, pivoting away from my role at Scopely. And the reason that I joined PeopleFun was actually that my move to LA was always incomplete. And My family was based in Dallas. This opportunity came up when Wordscapes was being prototyped. And I, of course, had known John Book Scott and Tony Goodman from before. And so they had been reaching out to me and talking to me about this great new word game that they were prototyping. How interesting that they were looking at competitive references of games with anagrams where you would connect the letters, but how do you actually make the UI feel good? And how do you make it make sense, right? Because after you make a word, maybe they float up to the top or they disappear, but it feels very disjoint. So when they came up with the idea to have a crossword at the top that the words would go into, Wordscapes was born. And I was speaking with them about this and about introducing some live ops events to the game, such as tournaments. And back then, The discussion was super interesting because I fall into the demographic of our player base, but at the same time, I play a lot of RPG and RTS games, so a bit different than the typical Wordscapes player. 
And I said, well, we should probably try some tournaments that has worked in every single game that I have ever laid my hands on. And I bet it would work in Wordscapes too. And at the time, the prevailing thought was that perhaps an older, predominantly female player base would not be interested in competition. And I said, but you just told me that I fall into that demographic and I love nothing more than a competition and then winning. So <laughs> we decided to A-B test tournaments and of course, iterate on them. Don't stick with your V1. You should always tune and test. And it was a great result. We got 25% lift to LTV from introducing tournaments and tuning a little bit. So that was a lot of fun and really rewarding. That was really the start of my career at People Fun. I started as the one and only product manager at the time. I believe I was the 17th employee and grew product analytics and user research from scratch, which was so rewarding. I, I love building organizations. I'm wondering for Wordscape, was it the first game trying really to bring, I wouldn't say a new, but a, a better in terms of UX experience, like an Enneagram Word Games? Weren't there other competitors at the time or was it really like the first and then like taking really that, that segment in the market? There were other competitors at the time, but none that had combined the letter wheel at the bottom as the UI with the crossword at the top. I think that was really the innovation, putting those two pieces together so that it made sense. It was a great, simple, smooth UI to connect the letters to make the words. And then it made sense how the words were related to each other on the crossword because certain words cross over each other. It makes the puzzle more interesting and it also makes it a little bit easier for players, especially when you get to the end and you're trying to guess the last few words and you've already guessed most of the words. Seeing how the words are all connected does help a bit. I really like the experience of playing the game Worst Case when I found it. Uh, although I'm not a word game player, but I just enjoy like the tactile experience and how the visual effects, you know, like the whole round was really pleasant. We also did a bunch of testing around the meta, especially recently. The meta used to be just a very, very simple landscape, beautiful photo of mm -hmm, a desert mm -hmm. or a mountain or perhaps some Caribbean island, really, really beautiful backgrounds. And we thought, Well, players do enjoy that, but could we give them an experience that they could potentially enjoy more? And we tested Wordscape's Wildlife, which is our pets feature. So right on the home screen, players have a fox or a bird or some other kind of animal as a pet to interact with. And as you interact with and level up the pet, you get bonuses to the rest of the game, to brilliance, to coins through bees. Uh, and it's a really interesting and pretty light meta mechanic. And players seem to like it quite a bit. So it tested fairly well in A-B testing, and we're continuing to improve that feature. And so back to the history as well, 2011, the category has remained around word games. Is there a reason? Are the founders really into word games? Or was it really like an interesting segment of the market to really explore? I think Tony in particular is very much into exploring the word game genre He really loves the challenge, and he was basically told that back then in 2011 that no word game could ever be a free-to-play mobile commercial success. And so he sought to prove that wrong, and he did. Uh -huh. So you have Wordscapes in 2018, like starting to grow with a team of 17 people, just one product person. What were the steps as you get like more revenues? How did you build the product strategy as the first product person, right? So do you invest more in growing the game so the game team becomes the company, sort of? Or how did you split teams into building over, you know, side product or sister product to support the main game? How did you approach the growth period of Wordscapes and the company back in 2018? Well, back in 2018, I wasn't head of studio yet. And so the way that I approached growing the product org was very carefully because when you're a small org and you've just hit your major success and you're trying to scale your team, the first few additions matter a lot because you're forming the foundation of your culture. So it's very important to vet properly. It's very important when you're scaling the org to get your more senior, more experienced individuals first. 
I definitely saw as we were scaling in different areas of the org that people would hire their friends, people that they enjoyed spending time with every day. And when you've been in the industry long enough, you certainly have 25 to 30 people who are your friends who are excellent at their craft and perhaps excellent at both independent contributor and at management work, right? Those unicorns, maybe you'll have 25 to 30, but you don't have a hundred, right? So it's really important to approach recruiting from talent density, experience density, and data-driven perspective where, yes, of course, we want to be friends with everyone we work with. We want to get along with everyone we work with. But first and foremost, they need to be able to do the job and do it excellently. And they need to be able to grow as well because the situation is dynamic and what is fully skilled up today will not be adequately skilled up two years from now. A lot of times when you hit your first major success, there can be a lot of pressure to scale and scale unsustainably. Like, oh my goodness, we just went from a $20 million a year business to $120 million a year business in basically a year. What do we do with that? How do we scale? And there can be a lot of pressure to scale really quickly so that you have enough hands on deck, but a more careful approach generally leads to a better result long run and less turnover in the long run. What did that mean as well in terms of growth? Because I've seen, especially when you are not an independent company, that expectation of growth, once you have like some sort of success hit, like, okay, first year of this and next year, you know, like 10x or I don't know. So did you have control as a company to define your pace, your growth? How far did you look at the vision of a game, right? A year, three years, five years, and then how you would scale the team? Well, our partnership with our parent company, AppLovin, has always been very, very healthy and one that is of a dialogue and discussion. So certainly when we took a look at the growth of PeopleFun as a studio, we were able to scale from about 120 million up to over 300 million in a short period of time. When it came to the structure of the org, you're, of course, trying to grow your existing line of business, right? Wordscapes is our golden goose, and it's got 4 million daily active users that we need to serve properly, right? Give them the features that they want, give them the experiences that they want, the stability. And we also need to look to future growth. And really to grow the performance of the entire studio, we need to grow on a couple of different fronts. I'm just going to lead into the mission statement that I set when I became CEO, addressing the needs of the studio at that point, which is to learn to innovate and to learn to innovate in a data aware fashion where you are not just saying, I am passionate about making this kind of game. I've wanted to make this game since I was 13. So I'm going to spend $10 million a year of the Mm -hmm. company's resources for three years and just make it. And then you realize, oh, there's no audience. The audience Mm -hmm. is just you, right? Of course, we need to be very responsible with that. First of all, controlling our operating expenses on new game teams because those teams are not generating revenue or profit just yet. So Mm -hmm. keeping the teams very lean, very expert, very rapid, and exploring a lot of different game ideas, realizing that not only in game development, but in all product development, about 95% of all new ideas fail. And the trick isn't magically discovering the five out of 100 that won't fail, but the trick is working through the failures quickly so that you don't overinvest in them. And that requires data. So what we do at PeopleFun with our new game teams is we have rapid prototyping teams trying to figure out whether new game concepts, new core gameplay, new metas are fun at all. And when they find the fun, then we increase the team size from just three, you have a designer, you have an artist, and you have an engineer, we increase the game team size to about 10, and they start working towards collecting their data points. Art concept testing so that we understand from the target audience whether we are targeting the correct style for the game. And then creative testing, do we know how to make a good ad for this game? When we test it, do we get a high click-through rate? And then market research, 
who else is in the market? What is the market size? Is it fairly saturated? Do we think we can grow the pie or are we merely trying to steal share from someone else? And then, of course, gearing towards D1 retention and CPI testing. And we have very strict benchmarks for that because we know from experience with our portfolio, if we don't hit a particular D1 at soft launch, chances are the profitability window of a game is very, very short. And I think this is also the difference between traditional hyper casual and people funds games, which we like to toot our own horn and call them premium casual. I think the the difference is really the retention and the longevity of the players, right? So Wordscapes has a very significant percentage of the player base that has stuck around for three, four, five years. And that is an opportunity to monetize not only through IAP, but of course, through ad experiences, which is the expertise of our parent company, AppLovin. And so I'm curious as well, more on the company level. The company today grew from 17 to 100 people, like you mentioned, and you also started from product, but then evolved to a head of studio position to ultimately CEO. How did that happen? What were the steps? And, uh, you know, maybe related to the product growth and company needs, could you walk us through this journey? So in 2018, we had Wordscapes and it didn't have very many additional features. And we successfully tested a whole bunch of new live ops features that included not only competition, but teams, vanity collectibles in the form of player portraits and butterfly scenes that fit quite well into the Zen feel of the game. But we also embarked on finding our next successes. So we came up with a traditional word search game, which is still doing quite well. And we're continuing to introduce new features into and also porting successful features from Wordscapes into search and testing them. And they're testing quite well. And then, of course, also Blockscapes, which is new and interesting for us because it was not a word game. And we wanted to challenge ourselves taking a look at some of the competitors that were doing quite well. Could we also make a block puzzle game that would be a market success? And while it didn't obviously grow to be as large as Wordscapes, it is profitable in its own right. And learning to do that and learning that process is really important. When it came to being head of studio, what was really interesting about it is that my founders are amazing. And their bread and butter is really running game teams of about 12 to 25 people with their old colleagues that they have known for decades and decades, turning that into a commercial success, selling that startup, and then wash, rinse, repeat. When it comes to scaling an org after acquisition and really scaling from 25 to 100, they will readily admit to you that that's not their favorite thing to do. <laughs> and so they wanted to find a leader who would find joy in doing it and who could do it well. And also to transform the organizational culture from one of all close friends to a very, very performant team. So changing that mindset is challenging because people need to be trained to be comfortable being uncomfortable because growth is uncomfortable. Anything that we have done a thousand times and mastered is comfortable, but growth, trying something new, something that we don't know how to do, or maybe we've tried it a couple of times and we don't do it well just yet, but we're trying to build up the competency so that we can eventually master it. And changing people from the prior culture to the current one was really interesting. And we invest heavily in professional development. We not only spend $1,500 a year per employee on professional training that they choose with their managers, but we also do group training, leadership coaching, management training, communication training, production training, product training, you name it, right? Tableau training, that one is actually coming up later this month. I, I like to joke around like for my birthday, I got Tableau training for everybody on the product team. So I, I love that. And I love investing in people and seeing them grow. And that growth translates into a result for the business. It must translate into a result for the business. But at the end of their careers, no matter where they end up, 
I want them to look back and think People Fund grew me the fastest. They invested in me the most. They gave me opportunities that I wouldn't have gotten elsewhere at my level. They gave me the appropriate training and I was able to succeed and I grew the fastest there. That's what I want every employee of mine to be able to say. Mm. It's amazing. And I think I've seen many companies going through this, you know, post acquisition, growing fast. And something we I haven't heard so much is the transition and how do we support? Because what I've seen so far is mostly more conversation and alignment. Okay, so this is where the company is going. We explain, we show the path, but it's your decision, right? It's a starting point, right? Having the conversation. But here, what I say, and please elaborate to correct me if I'm wrong, here was a heavy investment in training. Let's, let's give the best chances for everyone to take the path. And I'm sure eventually as well, there are some who, okay, I can learn, I can grow, but maybe that's not for me and I don't take it. But this would be kind of a last option after you invested in training. Is that correct? Definitely need to invest in training first to do an assessment of potential and an assessment of your employees' really energy and desire to grow, right? Because they have to want it first mm -hmm. before it really takes. When it comes to an organizational level, one thing to really pay attention to is, do you have all of the necessary layers? Because it's very typical that companies would start out with their executive team and then perhaps work on the lieutenant level to their executive team, their VPs, their senior directors. And then all of a sudden, you see a lot of orgs hiring entry-level juniors and then getting very bottom-heavy mm -hmm. and then wondering what happens to their productivity. Because what actually happens is that then you're missing layers, right? You're missing your mid-levels who are learning to manage, who have a couple years of management under their belt and can each manage one to two direct reports. And instead, you're having your directors, your senior directors, your VPs manage a dozen people each while also needing to do their own IC work. Mm. And you're seeing their productivity take a hit because managing junior employees, especially entry level, is an investment. It's an investment that takes years before you actually capitalize on any kind of return, right? But certainly at People Fund, originally when we scaled, we were certainly missing those middle management layers, the glue that really holds your director levels to your entry levels. But in order to set people up for success, you don't overnight expect them to master the new role that you have assigned to them. You really need to invest and work on training them up to it. So For training new managers, it makes the most sense to give them one direct report and to guide them on every aspect of the training and the management. And really with any kind of training I do, I use the EDGE method, which is originally developed by the Boy Scouts of America. And in that method, you're first investing as a mentor in a great deal of time explaining to the mentee conceptually what you're trying to teach them and why it's important. And then further explaining the mechanics, right? So you're explaining the strategy first, and then you're explaining tactically how it all works and potentially different methods to arrive at the result. And that's really important so that they can check their own assumptions and check their own confirmation biases so that they can try several different ways and see if they arrive at the same answer. And then you demonstrate. So as the mentor, you are actually doing the work in front of your mentee, which means you have to have the technical skill to do it. And you're showing them as you're doing it, the story behind why you're doing it a particular way how you're checking your work, how you're identifying your own mistakes and correcting them. And that also demonstrates the willingness to admit, I make mistakes and then mm -hmm. I find them and I correct them. And that's the way it's supposed to work. Nobody is perfect. You should expect to always make mistakes, but of course it's better when you check your work carefully, find your own mistakes and fix them than when you pass your work down and somebody else needs to discover and fix your mistakes. 
And then the next stage is really guiding your employee to do the work. So the tables have turned. You are no longer doing the work with them as the observer. They are doing the work with you as the observer. So the mentor as the observer. And you're giving them reminders and tips as they're doing it. They're asking questions as they go along. So they're also checking their ability to identify areas that they are not expert in yet. Identify areas where they need clarification or they're not sure, or maybe they need a correction. And the ability to question yourself, the ability to check yourself is so, so important at every level. So getting the practice in there is very good. And so after guiding is enabling. So they work very independently. You're doing reviews of the work for accuracy and to ask thoughtful questions that might expand the scope of the work or might change the direction of the work. But in general, that's very high level feedback, right? And so you go from very low level, very intensive explanations of how everything works and then demonstrating yourself how to do the work. I would say the bulk of the investment is there. And then by the time you have an employee who can be successfully guided and then successfully enabled to do the work, they're flying. An interesting part as well where I was reflecting was investing in the middle layer of management. It's like the management position in the middle are never considered as full-time position or needs, you know, because they are not doer positions. They don't have like a direct output. And so usually those are discarded or not prioritized when you are making a hiring plan. But this can be systematized when we think about it, like, okay, when we have a certain number of people who are junior or intermediate level, it's wise maybe to have, I don't know, X person based on, so would you have, here it's more so for audience, like how to approach the structure where we find ourselves like, oh, maybe we need someone to support this group before things break. Certainly the other executives and I at one point during our growth found ourselves each managing 12 to 20 employees, which is just unsustainable, right? (laughs) When you hire managers, they need to be very experienced. They need to have a proven track record of success, not only in business results, but in the relationships, the long-term relationships they have Mm -hmm. formed with their former employees. And so we're looking for all of that When it comes to training up a brand new manager who hasn't managed before, that's additional work, right? That's not immediately a value add and you give them one direct report and you have to manage them very closely on their management. When you're bringing in experienced managers, probably a good ratio is making sure that each experienced manager has no more than six to seven maximum direct Mm -hmm. reports. That's about as many as they can manage while doing each of their employees justice. So it's not just, hi, I'm checking in to be your cheerleader. How are you doing? Great. Bye. (laughs) But really actively managing on the work. And I found it interesting the way that you talked about the management layer as like pure management, but not really producing work of their own. I think about it in the way that if they have the technical skill to make all of their direct reports work product better, I consider that absolutely work product. What I don't want to have is a management layer who are not technical experts at the work so that Mm -hmm. when they are managing their employees, it's not so much skilling them up and working on professional development, but it's more like therapy. I firmly believe that the management layer needs to be able to handle the technical skill piece of it. I see also we're reaching the end of the conversation. So I have maybe a few, one last question. What are the things like really at this stage of the company makes you feel the most excited, you know, of what you do? Because it seems like you're very also human, but you know, CEO, like with a, like I said, full personality and I can just get your energy by watching what you do. So I wonder, you know, part of your work, what are the things you enjoy the most? Yeah, I really enjoy mentoring people. I enjoy watching them master new skills. In the beginning, it's always such a struggle. And a lot of the best people have imposter syndrome. So they are 
excellent. They hold themselves to a high standard, but there's also that fear of being judged, which sometimes mistakenly looks like a fear of trying, right? So Mm -hmm. to break them out of their shell and get them growing and watch them master their technical skills, watch them gain the confidence to take leadership roles on their team, gain the confidence to speak with others about their journey That's really my joy in addition to working on gaming product. I would also say that when it comes to the working relationships that I build, I love to manage and mentor the whole person, right? So the career is a small part of all of their goals in life, but growing their skill sets and growing their career appropriately can enable many of the other goals that they have in life and unlock that potential. And so it makes me feel great. It makes me feel like I'm making a contribution to the world when I'm helping people see their own potential to reach it and then to use that success in their career to propel success in other avenues in life. Thanks, Carol. I would say this is your answer as a, you as a human, and that's great. You know, it's like you're not answering as the CEO, but as the human behind the CEO. And I think we need to hear more of those motivation and those stories. So thanks for sharing. Thanks so much, Sophie. I really enjoyed speaking with you. Thanks for listening to this latest episode of the Rise and Play podcast. I am trying to grow a community of conscious leaders across the industry and beyond. So if you want to join this movement, please share the podcast with other conscious leaders because we have so much more we can learn from each other. Also, please don't forget to follow the show so you don't miss out on future content. Every episode is packed with actionable insights that will help you improve your leadership skills now. And if you are interested in learning more on the topics that we discussed today, you can find more insights on riseandplay.io and there you will also find my free masterclass on conscious leadership. So have a great week and until the next time, 